Alright, hello everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm really happy to be speaking here today. Uh, my name is Jin Si, and just so you know, I flew all the way from Singapore to get here, man. So I am currently suffering from massive, massive jet lag, okay, just so you know. Um, and just a disclaimer, if you find any of my slides later on really silly, uh, it's not because of the jet lag, it's just because I'm a really silly person. So as you can tell, because this is my GitHub username, uh, I currently look like this right now because my GitHub student discount coupon expires next week, cry. And uh, basically, right now, to use a Singlish term derived from a Malay word, I am lepaking before I start work. Uh, although the, a more accurate depiction of my everyday right now looks something uh, more like this. Um, strange to say that at a tech conference, but it's true. Um, and you know, so yesterday actually I was uh, furiously uh, drawing and I was also paying attention. But yes, I was drawing, so that's why I'm still alive. Okay, so my talk today uh, is called All I Wanted to Know About Ruby's Object Model Starting Out and More. Now, I have to say this is the almost exact same talk I gave at a Red.Ruby conference in June this year, so if you were at RDRC, I'm very sorry. You have to spend the next half an hour listening to me talk about serious things with silly drawings again. Uh, but, you know, just before diving into the topic proper, I want to talk a little bit more about my motivations behind this. So why this topic and uh, why this talk? So if you ask me why this talk, the first thing I'm going to say to you, of course, is free RDRC tickets, yay! And although I completely, totally did not expect it, but free RubyConf MY tickets, yay! Um, but of course, uh, I want to approach this also as someone who still has a lot to learn about the language and programming in general. So the question I have is, what is it like to be a beginner learning Ruby? And I'll just give a brief outline of you know, my personal experience. So in the beginning, everything is great, right? Language is clean, clutter-free, expressive, sometimes even reads just like English. And blocks, procs, enumerators, lambdas are slightly strange, but you get the hang of it after a while. And the, base, the mechanics of the basic object-oriented paradigm aren't too hard to pick up. And pretty soon, you're writing your own classes, subclassing them, uh, mixing in modules. And so you are in love. But if you hang around with Ruby long enough, you start to see fun stuff like this and this. And you hear about singleton methods, meta classes, extending modules instead of including them, and so on and so forth, and a lot of head scratching ensues. And maybe you keep reading and rereading Ruby docs or various blog posts, but you still can't quite figure out the difference between class eval, instance eval, or you, can't quite, you don't quite understand what that self.included hook is doing down there. And you decide that you should be able to do better. You should be able to build a mental model that has the explanatory power of unifying all these disparate bits of Ruby. And so that is basically uh, what I set out to do, and that's all I wanted to know about Ruby's object model starting out. But, because I'm also a freaking completionist, I decided to dive into the CRuby source itself, and that is where the more comes in. So, without further ado, uh, here is all I wanted to know about Ruby's object model starting out as a story. So in the beginning, there was chaos. But soon from that primordial soup of procedural code, there sprung forth type defs and macros, and these gradually coalesced into the finest of all rubies. And Ruby said, let us make objects, but not in our image nor our likeness, for I am a jealous ruby and I want to be the shiniest ruby there is. And so was wrought the plainest of all objects, basic object. And basic object new kernel, and unto them was conceived and born object, and object begot module, and module begot class. Now, Ruby had given her creations dominion across the land, and so object set forth and begot many other classes whose multitudes of concrete instances soon spread across the code of the very many Ruby programmers in the world. And so this was the world that all the objects knew, and it was great and happy. Um, but Ruby had also given her creations a very special kind of power, which was soon to precipitate a great existential crisis. And this was the power of introspection. And so it was that one of the first objects, Doge, began to ask, what am I? And he discovered he could call the method class, and the answer was as plain as day. He was a dog, and so the existential crisis passed. Now, Doge was happy, but it was not long before Dog began to ask the same question. So he asked, what am I? Right? And so he called the method class and discovered that what he was was a class. 
And he discovered he could also call the method superclass and discovered that his parent was none other than object. And so Dog knew what he was and where he came from, and he was content. Yet this was not the end. Soon even the most ancient of objects began questioning their own existence. Basic object, object, module, class. All of them asked, what am I? And it turned out that all of them were classes. And they remembered whom had begot whom. The colonel asked herself the same question. She discovered that she was a module and remembered that she had no parent to speak of. And so this was the world that all the objects knew. And some of them thought the arrows were getting a little bit messed up, but they lived with it. Alas, the first wave of the existential crisis was now over. But soon enough, Doge began agonizing again. He complained to Dog. You say that as a dog, I should be able to bark and wag my tail and be stroked by my belly and so forth. I know that I'm different from the other dog instances. I weigh different and so on. But truly, I want more individuality than that. I want the means and the methods for manifesting my singly doge nature, not just to bark, but to go so doge and such wow. And Dog looked at him and shook his head, for he knew not what he could do. But in the night, Doge was visited by Ruby herself, who was full of sympathy for the poor animal. And thus she spoke, Thusly, I do grant you the power to be the Doge that you want to be. No longer shall you be a dog, but you shall be a singleton Doge. Yet to keep the peace, I cannot make this obvious, for if I do, dog will be jealous. And so was created a new class, the singleton class of Doge. But it was such that if Doge called the method class, he knew himself still as a dog. It was only if he called the method singleton class that he knew where his uniquely Doge abilities came from. Only Ruby knew that deep in the primordial chaos, Doge's true class was actually his singleton class. And so now Doge was happy. But now Dog had a problem. He prayed to Ruby. The programmers want me to keep track of all my dog instances and find them by their name. I can't do this with normal instance methods. I need class methods. And Ruby, remembering what she had granted Doge, saw a similar solution here. And so she spoke, Thusly, I do grant you the power to have methods of your own and not just methods that all classes possess. And so was created a new class, the singleton class of Dog. But because Dog himself was a class, this singleton class was like a class of a class. And so Ruby christened it a meta class to distinguish it from the singleton classes of ordinary instance objects like Doge. But in creating the Dog meta class, Ruby now had to create the class meta class, and the module meta class, and the object meta class, and the basic object meta class. And she made it such that the original genealogy was mirrored, so it was as if the basic object meta class had begot the object meta class, and the object meta class had begot the module meta class. And because we love arrows, she made it as if class had begot the basic object meta class. And so finally, the objects and classes were finally happy, although now their world had been very much complicated. And every so often, one of the meta classes would be wont to cause mischief, demanding that they have their own meta class. And these meta meta classes would be even more mischievous, demanding that they have their own meta class. And on and on would these meta 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 classes go until no one could see where the whole damn thing ended. And the ordinary objects and uh, instances just rolled their eyes and carried on their day to day, oblivious to all this meta madness. And that is pretty much where my Ruby creation story ends. So hopefully that was able to give you a sort of grand schematic overview of how Ruby's object model uh, looks like in a fun way. So now, dum dum dum, it is time for more. All right, so it's time for me to retell uh, the creation story of Ruby through the lens of CRuby source. So uh, as, we, as we know in Ruby, they say that all data is represented as objects, right? So Doge is an object, and Dog, which is, also, which is a class, is also an object. Now what this means in CRuby source is that all Ruby data is represented as pointers to structs. So a pointer is just this uh, arrow you see over here, which is uh, pointing to a value in memory address. And that value happens to be a struct. Right? Struct is just a bag of attributes or members. So now the question, of course, is what is in this struct? Or rather, what are in the different kinds of structs we have in CRuby? So there are three structs we primarily care about. The first is our object. So this is the struct that represents uh, ordinary instance objects. Second is our class. This is the struct that actually represents class objects. And you notice that both of these structs actually contain R basic. So that's the other struct we'll be looking at. So let's look at R basic first. 
This is the struct that contains data that's basic to all objects, right? So we have flags. This member basically contains metadata. So whether or not our object is an instance object, a class object, a module object, or whether or not it's a singleton class, that's all stored in flags. And very importantly, we have this class pointer here. So this is a pointer to an R class struct, which keeps track of what is the class of our object. So moving on to R object, it's really just R basic plus stuff. Right? And this stuff here, this union thing you see over here, it's basically a way of just storing instance variables. Finally, R class, again, it has R basic, so it has flags and class. And very importantly, it has this super pointer. So this is a pointer to another R class struct, which is a super class of my class. And next, we have something, a pointer to something called a Ruby class extension struct. We don't really talk about it much, but suffice to say, it stores stuff like class instance variables, class constants, and so forth. Finally, we have a pointer to the method table. This is actually the table that gets looked up on method dispatch. And so if you talk about method dispatch, this C function is where the key logic happens over here, right? In this for loop, we're basically saying, keep searching the method tables of my supers until I find the method with the corresponding name. And so if you call the method class on the doge, on, on doge this is the chain of R class structs whose method tables you will be looking up. Except, not quite, right? You notice there's a bit of a complication from kernel. Because if you, if you realize, kernel is not a superclass of object. It's a module that's mixed into object. But somehow it finds its way into the super chain over here. And we'll see how, more clearly how that happens when we talk about modules later on. So we've talked about how Ruby represents our data with the three kinds of structs. So now the next question is, of course, where does it all begin? Where does our creation myth actually start? And look no further than uh, this giant function, initVM object, in object.c. This is a really, really huge function. But right at the top, you see we're calling init class hierarchy. And this is the function, actually, where our class hierarchy gets bootstrapped. So after all these boot def class methods, our hierarchy goes like this. And after this, these are basic set class macro calls, we are actually setting the class of basic object, object, module, and class to point to class. And maybe at this point, you're wondering, like, where is kernel? So go back to init VM object, giant, gi gigantic function, but somewhere in there, we are actually defining kernel and including it in object. And so our diagram now looks like this. So this is pretty much uh, what you saw from the creation myth just now. In addition to basic object, object, module, and class, Ruby also initializes all the built-in classes like nil class, true class, string, array, and so forth. And so now the next interesting question is, what happens when we actually define our own class? So let's try to create a dog class. The function that gets called in C is this RB defined class ID, and it's basically doing three things. Right? The first thing you notice is that it's actually setting the super. So if the super is not explicitly given, um, we set the default super to object. So that's why all uh, our classes inherit from object by default. Next, we actually initialize the new R class struct with the given super. So this actually sets the super to point to whatever super was determined previously, and it also sets the class pointer to point to class with the capital C. And finally, we actually make and set the meta class of our new class straight away. OK, so before the meta class stuff ever ha even happens, this is how our diagram looks like. So it's pretty simple, right? We just created a new class, dog. We set its super to point to object. We set its class to point to class. OK, pretty simple. But that's before meta classes. Right? And before I talk about meta class creation, I, I, I want to clarify terminology a bit, because I know this is always a point of confusion for beginners, as it was for me. and I think this is worth mentioning. So a singleton class is basically synonymous with icon class. A meta class is a kind of singleton class, but it's specifically the singleton class of class objects. So we speak of the meta class of dog, but the singleton class of doge. And so because you realize that since singleton classes or meta classes are also classes, you can have meta classes of meta classes. So meta meta classes and meta 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 classes. And in general, you can have meta to the n classes Although if you think about it, like any n greater than 1 is practically useless, right? But it's just kind of fun to realize that Ruby's object model actually allows you to do this. OK, so let me talk about meta class creation. So Boromir knows well that one does not simply make a meta class. And indeed, if you look at this make meta class function, it is not the easiest to digest. But let me break it down for you again. It does simply three things. So the first 
is that we actually initialize our new meta class as a new R class struct. Secondly, we need to set the class pointer of dog, our original class, to point to this new meta class. And then we need to set the class pointer of our meta class to point to something, something to do with this initial eigen class temp macro you see here. And then finally, we need to set the super pointer of our meta class to point to, again, something. So let's see uh, diagrammatically what happens when my function is executed up to this point, right? before we actually call this funny macro. So up to this point, it just looks like this. Pretty simple. We created our new single uh, meta class, or singleton class. We set the class pointer of dog to point to it. And now we need to set this class pointer to point to something. OK, so what is that something? Go back to our function. This something has to do with this ensure eigen class macro call. And basically, what this returns at the end of the day is the meta class of class. So the super class, the, me the meta class, the class of dog's meta class is going to be the meta class of class. And if the meta class of class doesn't already exist, we have to go and make it. Right? So we have to call make meta class on class. So let's make the class, meta class of class. It's again it's the same function. Let's make meta class. So that we do the same thing, right? We initialize the new R class struct, and then we meet the same problem. We have to set the class pointer of the meta class of class. Now you notice that for the meta class of class, we actually execute a different branch of the if else conditional. And so this line basically says that the meta class of that the class of the meta class of class is itself. Right? So the class pointer points back to itself. And our diagram looks like this. So this class pointer points back to itself. So now we're happy with the class pointer, but what about the super pointer? Well, let's look at the function again. Now it's this line of logic that we're uh, worried about. And the logic of this line is basically that the super class of classes meta class is the meta class of classes super class. Or in other words, the super class of classes meta class is the meta class of module. So it's like we're kind of setting off a chain reaction over here, right? Because now we need to set the super class of the meta class of module. And by the same logic, that's going to be the meta class of object. And then by the same logic, the superclass of the meta class of object is going to be the meta class of basic object. And so we've kind of reached the end of the chain, so what should the superclass of the meta class of basic object be? Well, if you go back to the function again, it turns out that it's just going to be class. And so you thought we were done, but actually we're still not done creating the meta class of dog, right? We just completely sidetracked creating all those other meta classes just now. So let's go back to the meta class of dog and finish making it. So now the last thing we need to do is to set the super class of the meta class of dog. And again, it's the same line of logic. And by the same logic, the super class of the meta class of dog is going to be the meta class of the super class of dog. In other words, the super class of the meta class of dog is going to be the meta class of object. And so congratulations, we are done. So all we wanted to do was to create one class, but we end up spawning like five other classes along the way and a gazillion arrows. So indeed, Boromir was right. But and maybe at this point you're like, oh my god, this meta class stuff is insane, right? Um, but fret not, because after this, making singleton classes is a walk in the park. And you can compare the, the, the size of the functions. So this is the function to make a singleton class. Again, pretty straight for, straightforward, and does three things. First, we actually sing, uh, initialize a new R class struct for our new singleton class. And an important thing to notice is that the super of our, my new singleton class is actually the original class of my instance object. So if I make a singleton class of Doge, the super of this singleton class is going to point to the dog. And next, we actually set the class pointer of Doge to point to this newly initialized singleton class. And finally, we need to set the class pointer of our newly initialized singleton class to point to the meta class of class. And so at the end of the day, our diagram looks something like this. And this is pretty much where our creation myth ended off. But you know, at this point, if, if you've been paying attention, you realize that we are still missing quite a big part of Ruby's object model. right? And that is basically modules. So how does including modules actually work? And the answer is that Ruby finds a very clever way of sneaking modules into our inheritance chain with something called include classes. So I want to give Doge some saber teeth, because that is cool. Right? So I include the saber teeth module into the dog class. And what happens when I do this is that 
Ruby is going to create this Sabertief include class that you see here, and it's going to insert it into the inheritance chain just like that. So now the super of doc points to this include class. And now the interesting thing about this include class is that it actually shares the same method table as my module. And so in this way, method dispatch just works like normal, right? We just go up the inheritance chain. OK, so that was pretty straight, straightforward. And this is, where the, this is the C function where the bulk of the logic occurs. This is a very long and convoluted method. I admit I probably don't even really understand it. But this is the main part where we are creating the new include class. And we are inserting it into the inheritance chain with our class set super. Now, I should mention that because modules and include classes, they are just R class structs, right? And R class structs, at the end of the day, they're just going to have this class pointer. So we know the class pointer of uh, modules, they just point to module with a capital M. So the class of Sabertief module is module. But what about the class of our include classes? Well, as you can see from this diagram, the class pointer of our include classes just points to the module it was created from. And this is how our include classes actually keep track of the modules they were created from. OK, let's talk about a very common scenario, including uh, multiple modules. So uh, Sabertief is not enough, right? Make Doge even more kick-ass, I give him sunglasses. Yes. So I include Sabertief, and then I include sunglasses in the dog class. And what happens uh, when I do this is that by the logic of how the include modules add function works, uh, inserts the include class into the inheritance chain, the module that's included later is basically inserted lower down the chain. So in other words, the method table gets looked up first. OK, so that was fairly simple. Let's talk about something not uh, less simple, but more interesting. What about including modules in modules? So at this point, I should say again, include classes and modules are just R class structs, right? And other than the class pointer, R class structs also have a super pointer. And if you've been paying attention, you may at this point be like, wait a second, can modules actually have a super? Okay. Right. If you think about it, you don't really think of modules having a superclass, right? But the answer to this is actually, yes, modules can have a super, but not by default. Okay, by default, the super pointer is actually null. But this super pointer actually comes in handy when we include modules and modules. So let's take a look at how that works. So instead of giving Doge saber teeth and sunglasses, I want to give him saber teeth sunglasses. Okay. So I include the Sabertief module in the Sunglasses module, and then I include the Sunglasses module in the dog class. Right, so Saber Sunglasses Doge. So when I include the Sabertief module in the Sunglasses module, what happens is basically it's not really very different from including a module in a class, right? I actually create a Sabertief include class. I set the super pointer of my Sunglasses module to point to this include class. And then when I finally include my sunglasses module in my dog class, I end up getting two include classes inserted into my inheritance chain just like this. And then method dispatch works just like normal. All right, cool. So I've covered actually a lot of stuff, right? I talked about how objects and classes are represented in CRuby. I talked about how singleton classes and meta classes are created. And I talked about how modules work. So before moving on to the next part of my talk, I would be remiss uh, not to clarify these differences between the C class and super pointers and the Ruby class and super class methods. I'm sure you're wondering if, if that's why there's a discrepancy between the two. Uh, and it's really uh, not very difficult. So the thing about Ruby's class method is that, yes, it basically follows this C class pointer, but it just kind of ignores any singleton classes and include classes along the way. So if I try to find the class of dog, I'm going to follow this pointer, but ignore all this stuff in red, and I'm going to come back, and hey, the class of dog is going to be class according to Ruby, at least. And what about superclass? It's essentially uh, similar. So the superclass does follow the super pointer stored in CRuby, but it ignores any include classes along the way. So even though the super of dog is actually the Sabertief include class over here, the superclass of dog is still going to be object. OK, so this is essentially where my talk ended when I gave it at RDRC. Uh, but since I was given slightly more time for this conference, about five minutes, I decided to add a little bit more content. Yay! So I thought that the best thing for a talk like this would be to like, kind of like compare the Ruby's object model to an object model of another class-based OOP language. Right? And so get ready, because it's Monty Python's Flying Circus. So yes, I will be talking about Python, specifically Python 3. 
Uh, and I really don't have that much time, so this is only just going to give you a, I just hope to give you a little bit of taste of how different the object models of both languages actually are. And hopefully for those of you who don't know any Python, this won't completely fly over your head, but for those of you who are familiar with both languages, ho I hope you find this interesting. So the first thing we should take a look at is what, uh, schematically, how are the object models different, right? And by now, I hope, I hope you're all familiar with Ruby's this object class diagram over here and this whole multitude of meta classes. So now the question is, how does Python's look like? And the first thing you notice, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I was just really lazy drawing these diagrams. But the first thing you notice is that Python's diagram just looks way simpler, right? And the big reason is that Python really only has one meta class. It only has one class that is a class of other class objects. And the name of that class is type. So that's one reason Python's object model seems to look so much simpler. And even though you could actually create more meta classes in Python by subclassing type, like you see here, uh, these meta classes are not integral to Python's OOP the way that singleton classes and meta classes are to Ruby. And another huge difference between the two languages is that instead of using modules for mixins, like Ruby does, Python actually does multiple inheritance. So if you look at this Python uh, code over here, the dot class inherits from K9 and rabies carrier, whereas in the Ruby snippet, dot inherits just from K9 and it includes the rabies carrier module. So thinking about differences between these two languages, it, it kind of brings up a lot of interesting questions, right? Because if you think about it, the whole reason why Ruby had this crazy singleton class meta class structure was so we could have stuff like singleton methods and by extension class methods. And if Python doesn't have any of that, you know, then how does it do it? How does, it, how does Python do stuff like class methods or static methods or even the equivalent to Ruby's singleton methods on instance objects? And I never knew the answers to any of these questions when I was learning Python in school on my own, and I never even thought to ask any of, these, any of this because I essentially never any, had uh, any conception of how object models even worked before uh, touching Ruby. And actually, the reason why I, got, I started poking around when I started learning Ruby was because when you think about it, like Ruby's object model has this very strange, recursive sort of elegance to it, which I felt was almost intuitive in a way. But anyway, you know, back to Python. Uh, I discovered uh, while researching for this talk that Python does all this stuff that uh, Ruby does with meta classes with something called the descriptor protocol. And I really do not have time to do justice to this, this gigantic topic in this talk, but you know, maybe I'll save it for all oh, I wanted to know about Python's object model, starting out or something. But probably won't happen, but anyway, the descriptor protocol is actually integral to the whole of Python OOP because it is the whole framework that governs attribute lookup and by extension governs method lookup because in Python, methods are just function objects that are attributes on the class. And like, the more I thought about this, this distinction between the two languages, and I hope I'm getting it right by saying this, but as I, the more I thought about it, uh, the, the more I, I realized that it kind of boiled down to this, this big difference between the two, right? So I think that Python is distinctly a function-based language, whereas Ruby is distinctly object-based. In the sense that in Ruby, if you think about it, like, there's no real notion of a function that is not bound to an object, right? So if you're aware, there is an unbound method class, but you cannot call an unbound method. You have to rebind it to an object before it can be called, right? So there's no notion of like a, a pure function object. Whereas in Python, it's the complete opposite, right? In Python, actually, methods are built upon function objects. And I thought that was a very interesting uh, difference. And I realized that, as I thought about it, that this difference was actually evinced by this very simple syntactic difference between the two languages that anyone who has played around with both immediately notices, right? And that's the parentheses behind the method calls. So in, in Ruby, as you all know, the parentheses are completely optional. Whether you put them there or not, your function is going to get called. Whereas in Python, they are absolutely necessary because if you do not put the parentheses after the method call, you're just going to get the function object. You're not going to get the result of the function call. And at the beginning, right, when I had just learned Ruby and Python, I thought that this was just, oh, this is just like a minor syntactic difference, right? It, Ruby lets you type less, yay, or the parsers are just different. Uh, but then as I thought about it more, I, I, I was like, hey, this, this difference in syntax, this simple difference in syntax, actually like a glimpse into how different the object models of both languages actually is. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So I've talked a lot. Uh, and maybe at this point you're like, ah, oh, yeah, all this internal stuff, so fun. Yeah, but why? Why? Okay. It doesn't help me become a better Ruby programmer than I did today, does it? 
Um, well, yeah, maybe I admit that knowing that I can create meta, 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 meta classes in Ruby is really not the most useful thing in the world. But, you know, two reasons, right? The first is just, well, intellectual curiosity. I hope you, found, I hope you find it interesting to like, just have a better understanding of how Ruby's object model actually works. And the second is, I, I do think that having a more solid understanding and even having like, an appreciation of how different kinds of object models can possibly work will, will help you reason more clearly about your code, right? And so in, in events that you ever meet any potentially confusing situations such as all of this, there is no reason for me to talk about it, uh, not because I, I don't have any time, but because you now have the awesome mental model to figure out all by yourself. The mental model I wish I had starting out. And more. So thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody, please pick your jaws off of the floor. <laughs> she did draw all of those. OK, any questions that you have? on the Ruby object model and now, by extension, the Python object model. Nobody? Everybody got that? Word for word? Promise? Come on. Yes. Our sponsored question of the day. <laughs> uh, anything beyond source code you can recommend to read? Oh, beyond source code? Okay, so uh, something that's very helpful for me to actually understand the source code was this, this online documentation, online book called The Ruby Hacking Guide. It was originally written in Japanese by, I can't remember his name, but it was, it was only written for 1.8, Ruby 1.8, but all the core stuff really hasn't changed that much, so it should really help you in reading the CRuby source. Is it translated already? Uh, yeah, it's translated to English, yes. Because I read it five yeah, years yeah, ago. So I don't read Japanese either, so. <laughs> Yes, and the other book is uh, Ruby Under Microscope, and that's the book that uh, Saron is reading with her book club. So you guys can join in on that. Any other questions? Oh, of course. Um, so I'm reading Ruby Under Microscope, so all those are really awesome. And those created way more interesting than happening than what's happening in the future. So my question for you is now that you know all this stuff, how does it change the way you code or the decisions that you make? Like, how do you take this? Okay, I'm sorry, that's a very bad question to ask me because as my, my, one of my first slides showed, I, I, I don't really program much nowadays because I'm, I'm waiting to start work where I will start programming as a proper programmer. Um, but I, this definitely helped me understand other people's code much, much, like much more clearly because in a lot of like Ruby gems and stuff, when you read the source, people use a lot of metaprogramming patterns that just completely like, what? What, what are they actually doing? And like having this kind of understanding of the object model, model uh, really helped me in reading, uh, reading and understanding that kind of code. So in a nutshell, that was casual learning in her spare time. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Any last questions? What do we have for Junchi? Yes, Louis, please. So uh, other than just the object model, uh, is there any uh, any part of Ruby where you uh, where you would like to explore more? Where you see a a large gap in your mental model? So I think for me it would be like um, kind of like the closures and the execution environment of of uh, method calls, because I think that is also actually quite a big part of the object model, that, right? Because knowing where your, fun your methods actually executed, the, the scope that your methods executed. And I think for me, I, I, that's something I completely didn't talk about in this talk. And to, me, to be honest, I'm not super clear on that at, at this point. But yes, that is definitely something that uh, would be good for any Ruby programmer to look into. All right, thank you so much. One more round of applause, please. Thank you very much.